Will 2025 be the Super Bowl of tax policy debate at the national level? And if so, what do voters need to know? Depending on what happens in November, it could be wildly different. Um, but you still have to have that concept of if you don't overburden and overtax, you'll see economic growth, and that actually still benefits and grows your revenue. On this episode, we sit down with Representative Blake Moore of Utah's 1st Congressional District to get his insights on the coming tax policy debates in Washington, and also discuss how to rein in federal spending and improve the social safety net. You're listening to Defending Ideas. Defending Ideas is a weekly podcast produced by Sutherland Institute. On this show, we are committed to renewing the principles of common sense conservatism, making you a better champion of sound ideas. This episode of Defending Ideas is brought to you by Zions Bank, sponsor of the 2024 Sutherland Institute Congressional Series. Welcome back to another episode of Defending Ideas. I'm your host, Nick Dunn, and this week we're talking about the future of the country, specifically in the realm of taxes, tax policy, government spending, a little bit of work and welfare. It's a lot of great topics to talk about things that impact the financial and economic health of the country and of individual Americans. I'm excited to welcome back into the studio Congressman Blake Moore from Utah's 1st Congressional District. Representative, thanks for coming back to Defending Ideas. Yeah, and with that opener, who's not going to be invigorated by those amazingly fun topics, right? (laughs) Tax, welfare, (laughs) spending... Uh, incredibly important, unfortunately, uh, even though they might be a little bit more on the drier side of, of the political discussions, it's, uh, it's, there's, there's not enough discussion of it and it's important. Well, that's one of the reasons why I appreciate your focus on it because, I mean, this is why we elect representatives, folks who can focus on the things that do have real impacts to kitchen table issues, but might at times seem a little wonky to the average voter. And so I appreciate your your focus, especially when we talk about federal spending and debt and deficits. It needs this steady drumbeat. So um, let's let's dive right in. If if we can, maybe start with tax policy. You've referred before to to 2025 as as kind of the Super Bowl of of tax policy, and that's because there there's a number of provisions from the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that that are scheduled to expire. Um, And so there's of course going to be a lot of policy debate around that next year. I want to get your take on how how important do you think this is relative to other issues? Maybe in other words, should voters be really enthused about this? And and if so, what what would you offer as a vision for how those debates should go next year? It just needs to be discussed more. I don't see it being discussed at the presidential back and forth level enough. Like that should be the primary focus, in my opinion, of of every single talking point that President Trump, who was um, obviously in the White House. When the, when the Republicans had the White House, House and Senate in 2017, and they were able to accomplish a lot of these really positive pro-growth tax policies. Um, so win on that record this is kind of what I what I say and focus on that record because it is important for Americans. But if they're only hearing what's kind of going on in the a lot of the political rhetoric that goes on in today's world, um, then I don't expect the American people to really you know, recognize the importance of it. So we need to put more focus on it. Uh, next year, like as you mentioned, there's a couple of provisions that stay s- stay permanent, um, but the vast majority of them will fall off. Those have been incredibly popular. How do we know that? Because Democrats had the White House in 21 uh, and the Senate and the House in t- for the for the 117th Congress, and they didn't remove any of them. There's a lot of talk that you know, this or that or whatever, but they recognize how popular they were and how strong they were. That's a quiet part. They don't really mention that much, but it's like, well, we wanted to, you know, they, they enacted a whole bunch of new spending then, but they didn't touch the um, tax policy. Why? Because they deep down, anybody that's focused on this knows that the competitive tax rates that we started, that we, we initiated in 2017, and some of the things like the foreign, foreign derived intangible income, it's called FIDI, actually helps us gain more revenue. It gets companies to reinvest back in American soil instead of offshoring a lot of these assets because of tax havens that exist, whether it's in Ireland and somewhere else in the EU or somewhere in the Caymans or something like that, where companies are bringing it back to the US. And you're, they're, 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 they're increasing their, um, the amount of revenue that they're, that, they're, that they're giving to their tax bill back to the US instead of offshoring it. So it's incredibly popular. Um, and it's a record we should be winning on, and I hope that we can, can hope that we can uh, be in a situation to to address the the, the short the 
the cliffs that are coming from it. And if these things all expire, there'll be a massive tax increase on every American and every worker in, a, in this country. It kind of harkens back to, to one of those longstanding conservative principles, you know, back to the Reagan administration about ha- having a tax code such that you're, you're incentivizing investment, innovation, competition, some of the things you mentioned. Is that, is that sort of a principle framework we need to have present in these conversations? And if so, how do you then carry that through to maybe the specific provisions that you would say, well, we need to keep these in place because of the good they have done? Yeah, I mean, it's just a data, it's a data, rec- you recognize the data. Um, and with that, you should be able to, to look forward and can continue some of the same good policies that, that have existed. And so as you, it, yes, it is a framework. Look at, look at our state. There is constant desire for companies to set up shop here, to move here, to start businesses here, because we have a, po- a really um, solid, low tax type of environment here in Utah. And in doing so, you grow that base, you still cover your expenses. And the federal government needs to just take a, 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 a kind of a key from, from those, you know, different experiments across the country saying, hey, we should, we should follow this. And that's what I love about the 2017 tax bill. It is not gonna be the same next year as it was in 2017. Things are different, political environment's different. We have different majorities. We have different, as we, and depending on what happens in November, it could be wildly different. Um, but you still have to have that concept of, if you don't overburden and overtax, you'll see economic growth and that actually still benefits and grows your revenue. Are there a couple of things that are top of mind for you that you think we should keep and other things you think we should change? What would you outline as from the 2017 bill, keep this, change that? We have to be hyper-focused on small business. Um, small business, there was path through, pass-through expenses that, that existed through something called 199A. We don't have to get into the specifics of it, but um, that expires. Uh, that will be a big hit to small businesses and individuals trying to invest in their own type of uh, entrepreneurship, things like that heavily focusing on small business and um, the things that we don't get credit for. Because when you do hear uh, some of my Democratic colleagues talk about the 2017 tax bill, they'll just say what is convenient and that it's a tax break for the wealthy. Like Nothing could be further from the truth. It doubled the child tax credit. That helps the, 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 the lowest and middle income Americans double the standard deduction. I mean, <laughs> you doubled the standard, we doubled the standard deduction. That gives an enormous tax break to lower and middle American incomes. Um, the corporate tax rate is gonna remain permanent, but it will be one of the most controversial things because Democrats are out there saying, okay, so it went from 35 to 21. Well, it, yeah, we agree, it might've been too high. They can at least acknowledge that it might've been too high. Secretary Yellen, said that to me personally when we were in our exchange on a you know a, a hearing year or so back but they say oh the 21 is too low well go look at the the oecd the sort of international um, tax governing body that that monitors all this that rate puts us in the sweet spot of competitiveness and therefore incentivizing people to come back so if we start ticking that up again you're going to see two things happen and these are the two things that I worry a lot about. You'll you'll see less foreign and you'll see less investment, and you'll they'll, they'll find other tax opportunities. Do you think it's any Do you think it's any coincidence that Sweden, after our, we lowered ours to twenty one percent, do you think it's any coincidence that they lowered theirs to twenty point five? I mean, that's blatant. And, and it seems clear. And if we start upping ours, they're going to say this is a great opportunity. We're going to keep it right at that, right? So you have to be competitive. If you're not competitive, you've given yourself no opportunity. And then you don't see real wage growth. And that is what benefits employees directly. And these are usually frontline employees. So that, that, that's where the arguments that it's just some tax break for the, the wealthy is complete bogus. Um, and what, it, what, what, what you see from it is real wage growth. You did not have massive amounts of, you didn't have inflation uptick like we saw from the Biden administration. And then you need to make sure that there's investment back in the US. Since it's an election year, I mean, obviously, and you mentioned earlier that the way these debates could go in 2025 will be impacted by what happens in November. So there's obviously a few different scenarios. Elections do matter. 
Right. And, and if, if, if the Republicans sort of sweep and, and sort of take full control of the federal government again, or, or if the Democrats do, or if it's kind of split government, if, if it's your party in power kind of across the board, what do you see on your wish list in terms of tax policy? And then on the other hand, if it's your colleagues on the other side of the aisle, what do you see as opportunities? It kind great, of walk great us through. Question. Yeah. Let me just throw out a few scenarios here. Okay. So let's go with White House, House and Senate under Republican control. Um, now, you're still in split government because there's this funny little thing that exists in the Senate. And you know what I mean? It's the filibuster. So the filibuster is there. It requires every single bill that it gets passed to be bipartisan. You have to get to 60 votes. It's not going to be a 60 um, Senate sweep uh, for Republicans. I can't. Im- I don't think that's going to happen. So every bill has to be bipartisan, except once a year, when you have the White House, House and Senate, you can do basically one bill per budget cycle. It's called budget reconciliation. That's how we passed the 2017 tax um, TCJA. That's also how we didn't pass, but we tried to. I, I wasn't there, but I say we as the as, as Republicans tried to pass um, a, re- a repeal in a place of Obamacare, but it failed. But they were going to use that. Um, they were going to use that budget reconciliation process. So if going forward, if we have that trifecta, we will have two bites at the apple for the 119th Congress. And I believe you have to do uh, a bill focused on deficit reduction, real mandatory spending reform. That's 75% of the budget in the, U- in, the, in the federal budget exists in the mandatory spending side, and we don't vote on it ever. And that's my biggest frustration. I've talked to you all about this before. I will continue to harp on it. Um, we only vote on the appropriations process. Well, we keep the appropriations process pretty well in check. It's only grown at a rate of one to five, one to th- one to four percent over the course of fifty years. All right, that's even at or even lower than inflation a lot of times. And you put that in check. Last year, we actually lowered that number um, for the first time in a while when Republicans took back over the uh, the House. So we have to be willing to go after mandatory spending. That's what budget reconciliation was designed to do. There's lots of programs. Even if you took Medicare and Social Security took them out, tried to do a bipartisan commission, which I'm very supportive of, Um, there would still be an opportunity for an enormous amount of wasteful spending that exists in there. So we have to take a shot at that, and then you have to redo a tax bill. So those are the things that you would see in a trifecta. If you have split government, let's say the Senate and and House stay Republican, um, or flip them stay Republican, and then you have a Harris White House. And this year, we had a really, really good tax bill that we negotiated with... um, Senate Democrats. Uh, Jason Smith, our chairman of Ways and Means, uh, put forth an exceptionally good, strong pro-growth tax policy. Democrats scoffed at it because it didn't go far enough on the child tax credit. And if you look at Harris's like wants and desires for child tax credit, they're far and away what Trump had done by doubling it. Doubling it is solid. What we were going to do this year's tax bill was index some of it to inflation and make some of it refundable. I don't like refundability out of this type of stuff. I just don't like it. But what we were getting in that tax bill was far and away more conservative, more more uh, economically sound. Um, unfortunately, it stalled uh, when it got over to the Senate. And, you know, we can talk about that. But uh, that was going to be signed into law by President Biden. So I'm trying to be out here calling balls and strikes. President Biden was willing to sign a bill that heavily favored Republican tax policy, even though they didn't get everything they wanted out of their certain things. As Harris puts out her wish list on child tax credit, she's not going to get that from a Republican Congress. Even though Republicans kind of started the child tax credit, we love the child tax credit. It's a good, it's a good tool to grow families and things. But that's just over, that's overkill. We will do a reasonable child tax credit and find ways to engage in some of these other provisions um, if that's the case. Uh, it won't be the tax bill we want if Harris is in the White House. But I do believe we can get something done, as we proved this year that it would actually have been signed. As you mentioned spending and you touched on some of the entitlement programs, and I want to dig into that for a minute. And and just to kind of to to re-up your message that you've shared repeatedly in recent years of of this distinction between mandatory spending and discretionary spending. And as you outlined some of these entitlement programs that that are in the mandatory spending category, Um, I want to ask sort of a related question on this idea of entitlement reform. And and specifically, you know, one of the the large programs is, of course, Medicaid. Um, And, you know, there's other other programs kind of in the safety net realm, SNAP. You've talked about Social Security as well. Exactly. And so when you look at these kinds of programs, one of the things that that we've been seeing, and we've had some previous episodes of the show talking about this, but there there is at times a work disincentive built into some of these programs. Not at times. It's embedded into it. 
Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Does that does that limit our ability to get maybe spending under control because if these programs grow and people too many do not have an incentive to get off because they would be made worse off if they took a job and lost benefits suddenly. How do we navigate all that? So I, I got the best briefing that I've ever had on this from uh, Amy Winder Newton, she's a Salt Lake County Councilwoman. She works on the governor's team. Uh, she had a group come in with me because she knew I was trying to get on ways and means and wanted to be involved in this welfare world and and find ways to do these more productively. Like, uh, and she she had a great group coming. It, it would be fascinating for every single one of us to uh, like understand the reality of, of this world. A very important thing. The safety net that exists shows that we're a nation that cares about those that are going through tough times, that aren't able to, that haven't been able to figure out a way or that have stumbled. Um, I'm all for it. And we need to continue to be, to, to make sure we're there. But the nature of these programs is if you don't make them productive, then they become a drag and they don't only just drag you and suck you into that world of just incessant, constant welfare. Um, it pulls our entire budgeting cycle down with it because you set up the program and then you, you can't really address it in a, in, in a way, and especially the way that we, f we do our federal budgeting is we, we just set them up as a permanent program and then you never actually get to vote on them. So the one thing that I want to continue to harp on is the appropriation side, those are the discretionary spending, grows at a rate of two to four percent. The mandatory side, because we never vote on it, grows at a rate of 12 to 15, and even probably worse in some cases. That is why we're in debt. Because in 1965, 75% of our budget was discretionary and only a quarter of it was mandatory. And that is flipped. And um, because that's flipped, we don't have any control over it. We don't have anything annually that gets us there. That's why I want to use budget reconciliation. Benefits cliffs, it's a graphical situation. Instead of providing so much here while you're making so little, and then when you make a little bit more, there's a big drop in your benefits cliff, you need to flatten that curve out and you need to make it so at some point those things hit, you, you're incentivized to continue. You don't, have, you don't take a hit, but you eventually get off of it quicker. And once you, if we create a system where folks are getting off of SNAP and off of TANF and off of Medicaid, then that immediately goes back to as, as a deficit reducer. Um, and uh, there's all the, with Medicaid, there's a whole other side of preventative health care will actually reduce costs because it doesn't become catastrophic if they don't just show up in the, the emergency room. There's real cost savings there too that I think we need to embrace uh, a whole lot more. But that benefits cliff thing is key because it's so counterintuitive and folks will say like, you can't go get that, you know, those two extra hours because then all of a sudden this benefit goes away. Well, lessen the benefit, make it work, but keep pushing people to reach that pinnacle and, and you'll ultimately get there. And it's, it's staggering when you actually see it done graphically. Is there room on, on that issue to sort of create a, a framework or a vision? Because I could see two, two approaches to it, where obviously there's the fiscal side, that these programs are expensive, they're growing. That growth rate you just mentioned is pretty staggering compared yeah. to the discretionary spending. And, and at the same time, this recognition that if folks are disincentivized to get off these programs, and they want to, and we've had them sitting in this exact chair, um, folks on these programs saying, I don't want to be on these programs forever. I want to work. I want to have self-reliance, but it feels like if I earn more income, I'm penalized, I'm disincentivized, and they have to create stability for their families. So I wonder if there's a way, and do you think this could have any traction in Washington even? Obviously, looking at what can be done at the state level, but at the federal level, could we approach it in terms of, of course, from a fiscal budgetary side, we have to find out find ways to help these programs get more people into work and self-sufficiency to constrain the growth of these programs while doing the other things you're talking about as far as the different categories of spending. But also it, it's an upward mobility message. It's these folks who are trying to escape poverty. Um, it's, it's kind of wrong or immoral almost that they hard work is not rewarded. Does that create a framework or a vision that you think could maybe have some traction in Washington? I, I, I'm, I'm you know, in my ripe old age of 44, I've still got my eye on a better future. And so I'm going to be hopeful that we can. Um, it's tough. 19, in the late 90s, you had congressional Republicans forcing President Clinton to do work requirements for certain welfare programs. 
he was willing to come on board, recognize the value of it, that balanced the budget. <laughs> we haven't come close to it since, right? And there, we've had Republicans and Democrats in the White House. Let me fast forward from 1997 to 2017. We saw the strongest economic upward mobility for minorities in our country than we've seen in a long time. That is the best, most productive way to get people off these programs. The benefits cliff thing is an annoyance and it, it hinders it and it ultimately needs to be fixed. But if you get people successful and able to raise wages and things like that, then you have more of a chance to actually sustainably reduce the amount of poverty in our nation. And we saw that with strong economic growth. And I, that's, that's my biggest worry as the tax, bringing it back to the tax side, if we let that um, expire, uh, will we see those groups that are traditionally more impoverished or you know less less economic growth opportunities traditionally in our country? Like that that is what we need to make sure we're building up. And and I don't want to harp on it right now, but go look at opportunity zones. Opportunity zones have provided investment opportunities for people to have a win-win. It's a great investment. It's not as high as some of the other investments out there. If you're to put your money with like a big hedge fund or something, but you're doing something, you know, more with more impact for our communities, and um, you're growing, you know, very more destitute type of uh, neighborhoods, and you see it in in some of our urban areas. They're here in Utah, and some in a lot of cases, but you know, I've been to them in Washington D.C. Traditionally, very very poor neighborhoods are having major development opportunities, healthcare wise, retail, housing, stuff like that. And that's because we're creating an incentive for it. We've got just a couple of minutes left. We've so grateful for your time fitting in this discussion with us. And we'll have to have you back to talk more about these things at more length as they progress. But any final thoughts on, in particular, I'm thinking for, for our listeners out there, for the voters, whether it's in the realm of, of welfare reform and upward mobility or tax reform, fiscal spending reform, um, tax policy in general, th this all kind of ties together in terms of creating an, an opportunity-oriented economy for innovation and competition, for upward mobility. But any final thoughts? What, what's the one big thing we all need to make sure we keep top of mind in these discussions going into the fall, going into next year? What's one thing you don't want voters to lose sight of? You know, this popped into my head. I've talked to you about the the nuts and bolts of the tax bill. I've talked about how you can improve welfare and stuff. Um, our nation needs to recognize the value of, and the and the and just if you want to make it purely economics, the value of strong, stable families. And um, this sometimes becomes a little uh, divisive or whatever for no reason whatsoever. We need to have strong families. As I think about my four kids, um, some excel in one area and others excel, excel in another area. And we are constantly navigating what's going to be best for Winnie and versus Max and Frankie and all that stuff. And, and, um, and we have to have that structure to be able to go and learn how to be an entrepreneur and get the education that you need to go, um, be successful. And we just, that's breaking down. And I said, and it has been for, 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 for many, many, many years. And, um, that's why you do see bipartisan compromise on, uh, the tax credit, the child tax credit. That's why you see, um, some of the, you know, the, the reason these welfare programs exist is to help to get those people a hand up. Uh, we just, we just can't be in an, in an, an eternal rut of, you know, that difficulty. Um, and so that's what my final thought would be that I wasn't prepared to, you know, talk about that in, in any, any way, shape or form today. But as I think about how hard it is for me with just, just for us, we've got a pretty, you know, we've got a pretty stable situation. Um, we need more of that. Well, I'll just say that as a father as well, I've got my wife and I have two little kids, a toddler and a baby. So the, the future is long in our perspective for them, but I appreciate the the reorientation towards family and opportunity and all of this sort of wonky tax and spending and work and welfare policy. It matters because it affects real people and their future trajectory. So I just we I appreciate can do that so, perspective. We can only do so much with a with a tax bill or a welfare program or something like that. And if we have if we have strong communities, strong families, um, like the American exceptionalism 
will thrive. Well, we'll leave it there because I love ending on hopeful tones. <laughs> Absolutely. Congressman Warren, thank you so much for being back with us on Defending Ideas. We'll have to continue these conversations as these ideas continue to move forward. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. We're going to take one more quick break before we leave you with some final talking points. This is Defending Ideas. Stick around. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with the latest policy debate that affects your life. The solution? Subscribe to Sutherland Institute's weekly newsletter, where you'll find in-depth insights from seasoned policy experts, compelling multimedia, and advance notice of special events. Visit sutherlandinstitute.org. Welcome back to Defending Ideas. Before we finish the episode, there are three quick points that I wanted to capture from our conversation with Representative Blake Moore. As he joked, these issues can kind of seem dry or, or a little wonky at times. They may not always be the kinds of things that are the kitchen table issues we talk about, the things that are really top of mind for, among voters that they get enthusiastic about, but they probably should be. And here's what I mean by that. The first note that I captured was that even something like tax policy that, again, can seem a little bit wonky at times is actually one of the most impactful ways that government at any level, in this case the federal level, can influence our daily lives because tax policy sort of sets the rules of the game for our economy. And that's something that can trickle down to affect all of us in a really direct way. And so I think the first key point is that voters should really be enthusiastic about this issue because of its propensity to impact daily life for all of us. So that's the first point is focus on the real debates that are happening and really try and focus on what has been done in terms of tax policy and what is debated about what's going to be done in the future. Focus more on the the reality of that and less on some of the campaign rhetoric that might be thrown around about an issue like taxes. The second key point is that voters also need to focus on what's really happening on on the issue of of spending and and federal debts and deficits. It's something that Congressman Moore has talked about many times and, and something that, again, can impact the overall financial health of the country. And if we don't get that issue right, there could be some really serious long-term repercussions. So two issues that we should just say, well, this should be top of mind for voters, tax policy, federal spending. It's important. And so we should be able to bring that up with our elected officials and have conversations so that they recognize it's a priority for voters. The third point that I wanted to mention is that another thing that Representative Moore talked about was something we've talked about a number of times on the show, which is the benefits cliff effect. And the really the key takeaway from that is removing work disincentives in the social safety net is something that will strengthen upward mobility at the individual level for folks who are striving to escape poverty. And also, when it ties into the issue of federal spending, can maybe help constrain some of the costs of some of these large entitlement programs. Because if more people move off of these programs, because they're incentivized to move to, move into work and self-sufficiency, that can maybe reduce some of the growth of these programs that can ultimately hopefully help make a difference on the fiscal side as well. Well, those are the key notes that I captured from our conversation, but let me know what you think. Share this content on your social media platforms and highlight what stood out to you from our conversation with Congressman Blake Moore and share it with your friends and family and encourage them to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, even wherever you like to watch or listen to your favorite shows. Make sure you click subscribe or on YouTube, click the little bell icon on the corner to get notified each time a new episode of Defending Ideas drops, which is every Tuesday morning. Again, you can get access to all of this and more at defendingideas.org. Please share this with folks in your circles. And if you're interested in supporting this work or the broad work of Sutherland Institute, if you want more conversations like this, please consider making a contribution at sutherlandinstitute.org slash donate. That will do it for this episode of Defending Ideas. Before we close, I want to thank once again our sponsor, Zions Bank, the sponsor of the 2024 Sutherland Congressional Series, appreciative of their support. From the Sutherland Institute in Salt Lake City, I'm Nick Dunn. We'll see you next time.